Let us remind ourselves the mission and vision of our church. It will be on the screen, those three things. We gather, we are being transformed to shine for Jesus. If I can read through those for you. We gather here today <clears throat> to worship our Lord as people ransomed by God. Through the preaching of the gospel by the power of the salvation, which is you know, God's power to save us by faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are being transformed from one degree, one degree of glory to another by the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Is that right? We are being transformed every time we gather together. And the reason why we are being transformed by Jesus Christ or through Jesus Christ by the Spirit is that we are being built up as a dwelling place for God. Building in our hearts a dwelling place where God dwells in us. And also through the powerful work of the Holy Spirit, as we allow the Spirit of God to work in us, we will live the life of Christ, our Jesus, and we will shine the light of Christ in our community and all around for the glory of God. Amen. And may we remember these three words all the time. Gather, transform, and shine. Before I read uh, the verses for today's sermon, I will also remind the theme of First John, which is the author John calls the reader's attention back to the three basics of Christian life. By this time, we should remember at least two of them. The first one is sound doctrine. The second one is Obedience, yes. Obedient living. And the third one is fervent devotion. You can review um, <clears throat> those definitions uh, in your previous uh, notes. Um, every time I preach, I mention those in your notes, or at least call them so that we all remember why we are studying First John. You know, the warmth of the fellowship beckons us to be united in the faith of God and also the mission and vision of this church as we open God's word and study every week. Amen? And we are not casual worshipers. We don't just observe God's word. But we open it up and read it for ourselves with the intent to obey God's word. I hope that's true in all of our lives. Today, as uh, we anchor ourselves in the profession to our mission and vision, that is to adhere to the Word of God and to abide in the truth of God's Word, let me read the sermon text from 1 John chapter 2, verses 24 through 27. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as the anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. This is the word of the Lord. 
What an incredible passage is this. The Word of God is not merely a collection of stories or a historical account, but it's much more than that. It is living breath of God's love for you and I. And in that, He teaches us, He gives us wisdom to guide us in this life. It is a treasure trove of divine inspiration and a wellspring of spiritual nourishment and a beacon of light in this dark and perverse world. And we need God's word more than ever as the day passes by, every moment. J.I. Packer, a respected author and a theologian, he once said, the Bible is God speaking. The Bible is God speaking. It means when we open the Word of God and read, it is God preaching to you and I individually and directly. Is that your understanding when you read the Word of God? And so as we prepare to hear God's Word today, let us remind ourselves to be those Berians, the noble Berians in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, where we see they received the word of God with all encouragement, with all eagerness, and examining the scriptures to see what they have heard are so according to the word of God. And so we don't just sit and observe God's word. We receive it as if God is speaking to us. And we don't even stop there. We go home. After we receive it with eagerness, we examine the scriptures. If what you have heard is from the word of God or not. Amen? Let that be our practice every day. Let me pray and ask for God's help. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the gathering of your people this afternoon here. Lord, we thank you for you are our healer. You healed our brothers and sisters who missed a few weeks, but you brought them here today, and so we are thankful for your healing. We thank you for your comfort during the time of uh, suffering that they have gone through. But again, your presence, your word is so, it gives us comfort to us. We thank you, Lord, for your word which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. We need more of your light in the light of your word for us to walk, for us to navigate in this world. Lord, as we study your word today, we ask the help of your Holy Spirit to illuminate our understanding. In that way, that your word, in the hearing of your word, in receiving it with all eagerness, that we will be convicted, as we heard last week, that we, had, we will all have the prick in our hearts that leads us to poignant sorrow for repentance. And guide us, Lord, into all truth. Help us to live out the truths we learn not just hearers of your word, but doers also of your word. Again, I pray for myself, Lord, that I speak your word clearly with authority and with boldness, the least among the brethren. But I thank you for giving this opportunity. And so may my words be your words. In Jesus' name, amen. So there are many themes in the New Testament, um, such as the person and the life of Jesus Christ in the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels. We see the accounts of Holy Spirit accomplishing its power through the obedient apostles and in their work. We also see number of letters written by the apostles, all through instructing us how one should conduct in the areas of individual lives, family lives, communal lives, and even in church life. But the one common theme that stands out throughout the New Testament is 
the Word of God calls us to be aware of and to arm ourselves from spiritual deception. And more and more, these letters from all the apostles, Peter, John, Paul, Jude, every one of them wrote those letters in the first century. And how much more we need those letters, those instructions for our life in these last days. It, the Word of God is so important to us. Last week we have uh, been warned by Brother Philip in the previous verses that we should avoid spiritual deception. We should be aware of anyone, those who leaves the true church to form a new group, claiming to have new revelation, new understanding, new truths that somehow the rest have missed or they don't have clue about. Watch out for them, John says. Be aware of them. In verse 20, we read, But you have been anointed by the Holy Spirit, and you all have knowledge, he says. He reminds his readers that you and I, as the children of God, have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. And we have all the knowledge that God has revealed in this book. We don't need any new revelation in that sense. Verse 21, he says, You know the truth, because no lie is of the truth. In fact, we must be discerning of doctrine. Verses 22 and 23. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Sound doctrine really matters because it is inextricably or inexpressibly linked with our personal relationship with God. Sound doctrine is all about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It is at most important. If you go wrong at the foundational level, at the fundamental level of sound doctrine, whatever you build on it, it will be like building on a sand which is bound to fall through the test of times. And so my prayer is that through God's help, you take this very seriously and heed to the word of God. Amen? This afternoon, we will continue from last week's uh, theme, Avoid Spiritual Deception, by abiding in the truth. And that's the title of my sermon today, Abiding in the Truth. And how do we do that? I have five implications for this, from these four verses. Abiding in the gospel, abiding in the fellowship with the Father, abiding in Christ, abiding in the Word, and abiding in the Spirit. Let us look into all those five one by one. The first part of verse 24, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. John writes. I mean, he's a brilliant writer. He is so concise in his words, but it has depth of meaning. As someone said, shallow, uh, shallow enough for a child to not drown, but deep enough for an elephant to swim. That's the kind of writer John is. You may be wondering, I do not see any mention of word or gospel in the sentence or the words that you read. Where are you getting the word gospel in this verse? I, I get that from verses 7 and 14 from chapter 2. Where John writes, he says, that you had from the beginning the word that you have heard. And in verse 14, you know him who is from the beginning. And the word of God abides in you, he says. 
It is the apostolic message that they received as firsthand by the apostles themselves. And the word is, which was from the beginning, and it is about the one who was from the beginning. Did you get that? The word they heard from the beginning by the apostles is about the one who is from the beginning. It is the original and authentic saving message of Christ's death for sin and his conquest of death. It is the original and authentic saving message of Christ, which is nothing but the gospel. Is it not? We see Paul writing to uh, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. He says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Christ Jesus who abolished death. It is the gospel message that they have heard from the beginning that John calls them to remember as he talks about those false teachers and their false teachings. And he says, let the word that you heard from the beginning abide in you. And the word, the Greek word for abide simply means to remain, to stay put meaning not to depart from what you have heard from the beginning. To help you understand, the same writer who wrote the Gospel of John gives the negative meaning of abiding and the positive meaning. In John chapter 5, verse 38, he says, You do not have his word abiding in you, meaning they have departed from the word. In John chapter 15, verse 7, he says, If you abide in me and I abide in you, 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 you get the meaning of it. If you stay put, no matter what you hear, no matter what goes on in your life, no matter what others tell you, if you hold on to the gospel, or John says, hold on to the gospel, hold on to the gospel. The gospel is simple message. But we make it so complicated because we try not to offend others. The gospel in itself is offensive. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, Paul beautifully gives the definition of gospel there. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, same words, we preached that you received, as John says, in which you stand, meaning you abide, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast, again, if you abide to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. And then he says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That is the definition of gospel. Christ came down, died, buried, and rose again in accordance with the scriptures. Your testimony and my testimony is not the gospel. My experience and your experience is not the gospel. My hearing voice, seeing visions, that's not the gospel. God may use all of that to call you unto salvation. But the same God who uses all those mediums would also point you to the word of God because the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin. If the spirit that you are claiming does not lead you to the point of conviction, then you should question, is that the spirit which is the spirit of, of God? Remember, the false teachers, they are claiming to have special understanding, a revelation. 
based on their esoteric knowledge, which is outside of the word that is revealed to us. They say, it is good you believe in Jesus, but you need to have this, and you need to have that and the other. For example, as my experience goes, I heard from a couple of them, you know, they say, after you receive Jesus Christ, for you to be truly saved, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Some of you might have heard those words. And they say, you go lock yourself fast for so many days and let the Spirit baptize you. And the evidence of that is speaking in tongues. That does not give you confirmation of your salvation. That is adding to what God has defined salvation is. It is not the true salvation. Hold on to what you have heard from the beginning, which is the gospel which convicts you of sin, leads you to repentance, and to be born again in newness of life. Okay. John's, you know, takes so much of pain to say the point is that the gospel, which is the power to uh, save, is through Jesus Christ alone and is found as revealed in the book, in the Bible. It is not a result of esoteric knowledge that only a few claim to have or achieved. Salvation is a gift of God given freely to those who believe in faith, Ephesians 2.8. You cannot know the gospel or learn by going into nature or having some mystical experience or by vision or reason or knowledge. None of that is gospel. You can only know the gospel, which is the truth in the light of God's word as revealed. No one gets to reinvent the gospel. Any deviation from the truth of the gospel is heresy, and this is what John calls spiritual deception which comes from the devil himself who is liar confuses people that's number one the first implication abide in the gospel let me move on to verse 24 the second part of verse 24 abiding in the fellowship with the father if what you heard from the beginning abides in you then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. Again, another brilliant statement from John as he writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit. If, you, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you. He's saying the same thing. He's saying the same thing, but with a condition, ex emphasizing the point that if, you abide in what you have heard from the beginning, then, he says, the next statement. He changes the order here. Like if, he, like if you remember in first chapter, verses, um, first chapter verse 3, we see the order as John writes that indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The Father comes first, and the Son comes next. But here in this verse, the second part of verse 24, we see the order is reversed, and it is not by mistake. And it is to stress that whoever claims to have a fellowship with the Father, unless you go through His Son, Jesus Christ, meaning unless you are saved, unless you believe him as the eternal God who is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father God, who is the king of all creation, who is the great I am, the one who came down, who died on the cross, paid the penalty for your sin. Unless you go through this Jesus of the scriptures, you cannot, you can claim you have fellowship with the Father, but that's not the right fellowship, he says. Everybody calls Jesus' name on their lips. 
But if you only watch them closely, you will understand what Jesus are they professing, what Jesus are they believing in. Jesus himself said in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father, what? But through me. Is that not clear? It is, this is the key, so don't miss it. If a person denies Jesus, is the Christ, and in all that I have said before, in John's own word, he says he is antichrist. If your Jesus that you're believing is not the Jesus of the scriptures, all of who he is from the beginning, John says you are antichrist. That's abiding in the fellowship of the Father, again, through Jesus Christ. Abiding in the gospel, abiding in the fellowship of the Father. The third thing, third implication is abiding in Christ for eternal life. Verse 25. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. God is, God the Father is the promiser, and his promise is made in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, we read, For all the promises of God find their yes in him, it says, that is in Christ. God has promised the eternal life in and through Jesus Christ. God the Father has promised eternal life in and through Jesus Christ, which is exclusive. Amen? And to me, God made it easy to believe because he made it so exclusive. The promise is inclusive in itself. It is made available to all, to anyone who receive it. But it is exclusive in the way that is, it is only in the name of Jesus Christ. John 3.16 we know that verse by heart from our childhood. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, whoever is inclusive, anyone, it includes anyone from any background, any religion, any faith, even to the atheists, whoever, it is inclusive, believes in him, in him is exclusive. No one can say all roads leads to heaven. Should not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life there. Abiding in Christ. Jesus is the ultimate example of not being politically right. There are no two ways about it. Matthew 12, 30, we read, He who is not with me, he says, is against me. Acts 4, 12, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which you and I must be saved. The exclusive claim is that there is salvation in no other name. That means our Muslim friends who believe Jesus as one among the prophet, they don't abide in the truth. Our Hindu friends who believe Jesus is one among several gods, they don't be abide in the truth. Our Jewish friends who believe and claim to be the sons of the God the Father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and who deny Jesus is the Messiah, they don't abide in the truth. And our atheist friends who consider Jesus to be one among the great teachers, 
who taught moral and ethical teachings, they don't abide in the truth. And if I can extend that, Christians who take the name of Jesus, who claim to be saved, who have been saved, but if they don't refer to the Jesus of the scriptures and have no personal experience of being convicted of their sin leading into repentance, they do not abide in the truth either. Nobody is exempt. Remember, the promise is by the Father. And it is made available to everyone who is willing to go through Jesus Christ. And the promise is eternal life. So abide in Christ for eternal life. Why would you run behind anything that gains nothing unto eternity? Don't waste your time. Don't waste your life. Fourth one, fourth implication. Abiding in the word that protects us from spiritual deception. Verse 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. See, the devil, the enemy, has been confusing people from the first century onwards. Talking about the new, new, church, uh, new Testament church. Even the apostles, even while they were living, they have to write these words, these verses, these letters, calling out the attention you know, of the believers to be aware of and arm themselves the spiritual deception. Paul in his last letter warned Timothy about those who will deceive. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, While evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, doing what on the screen? Deceiving and being deceived. And in the next verses, Paul exhorts Timothy, verse 14 and 15. He says, but as for you, continue, he says, the same word again for abide. Same Greek word is used there. Continue in what you have learned, which is the word from the beginning. And have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Again, Paul himself is calling to attention, Hey, you have heard those words from the beginning, and you know from whom you have learned it. Unless you examine the scriptures, you do not know the words that you're hearing are from the scriptures or not. Verse 15, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Abide in the word. And in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, we know he calls out, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who calls you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Watch out for them, he says. The devil is a deceiver and liar, as I said. If the devil can cause confusion at that level, which is foundational and fundamental, again, Everything that you build on it is bound to fall. Gospel is the foundation in that sense. And if it's not proper, the foundation you know, will fall. There are several gospel e errors that I want to call them, but um, you know, those errors are prevalent in the evangelicals. But time will not permit me, so I limited it to two. I think they are in your notes as well. Error one. Believing in Christ for salvation does not include repentance and submission to him as the Lord of your life. 
believing in Christ for salvation does not include repentance and submission to him as the Lord of your life. As a result of this teaching, there are countless who believe that they are saved because they did the sinner's prayer. But that confession of theirs have zero effect on their lives. And so they continue to live in sin-filled lives. They have been assured by those teachers who taught them that they have a ticket to heaven. Remember, Paul writes to Titus, describing these people as, chapter 1, verse 16, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Unless those people get the gospel right, it will probably be a shocker for them, a rude awakening when they stand before the judge, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who says, as we looked in Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Error two. This, I think you might have heard many times. I heard it many times. God loves you unconditionally. He has a great plan for you to give you all the success. If you are experiencing any problem, financial, health, job, wealth, try Jesus. He is all you ever wanted to be. And he will give you more than what you ask for. You heard these words. There is no mention of our sin which has separated God. There is no mention of repentance. There is no mention of forgiveness. There is no mention of being born again. God never told us to use these tricks to welcome somebody, but not tell them the true gospel. Remain in the word. Remain in the word, God's children. That leads me to the fifth one. First one is the abiding in the gospel, abiding in the fellowship of the Father, abiding in Christ, abiding in the Word, and abiding in the Spirit. Last verse, verse 27. But the anointing that you received from Him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and it is true, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. This verse implies the indwelling Holy Spirit in the lives of those who are truly converted. The anointing that you receive, John says, everyone receives it who profess to have been born again. In that sense, those who profess that they are born again, you and I have been anointed by the Spirit. And again, which is the work of the Spirit? How do I know that? John 16, verse 8. The Spirit convicts the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The work of the Spirit, whoever claims to have the Spirit, convicts people of their sin and the righteousness that God looks into, and the judgment impending 
thereupon. If one lacks the righteousness, the degree of righteousness that God requires, you and I, on our own, we, no matter however amount of good works and charity, cannot gain that righteousness to stand before God and plead our case saying, hey, I have done this, I have done that. Again, the evidence of the Spirit, anointing of the Spirit, that the elect receives, it starts with convicting the people. The Spirit then gives new life. We, get, we read you know, from John chapter 3, as Nicodemus you know, talks with Jesus, verse 5, Jesus says, Unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, Verse 8, so it is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Paul says or describes the Spirit as the Spirit of life in Romans chapter 8, verse 2. That means the Spirit that gives life, new life. Paul tells, uh, as in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, that God saved us by the washing and the regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. The regeneration work is the spirit in his recreation of the dead sinners into new creation. Did you get that? The regeneration work is the spirit in his recreation of dead sinners into new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. Again, I want to call the regeneration work of the Spirit is often referred to as illumination. I use that word while I'm praying before starting the sermon. Most of the time, the word illumination is often confused by many Christians who assume illumination means that the Spirit gives a new meaning of the Scriptures. But it's rather not. The Spirit's illumination is part of the Spirit's regeneration work where He calls, He raises the dead sinners to life. As a result of regenerating work of the Spirit, the Spirit indwells believers. Did you get that? As part of the regenerating work of the anointed Spirit, as John refers to, indwells in believers, all the believers. Because the Spirit knows who are His. Because He is the one who calls dead sinners to give them new life. And when they do that, the Spirit resides in them, remains in them. As some say, you need to call for the Spirit of God. Like in the old days where he used to come, accomplish his work, and leaves them. But in the New Testament, on the day of the Pentecost, I think we heard last two weeks back from uh, Pastor Daniel, who was here, he came to reside in each one of his children in whom he has caused them to be born again. Everyone can claim to have the Spirit, but their life should reflect it. The indwelling work of the Spirit is absolutely necessary for sanctification in the life of all believers. After we are converted, we are constantly being made new as we dwell ourselves in the light of the Word of God, in prayer, in discipline, allowing the Spirit to change us, to mold us, to shape us through the seasons of our time, of our life. That is called sanctification, right? where we will be more and more wrought out, made into Christ-like, Christ-like image in us, in our conduct, in our 
talk, in our deed, in our lifestyle, in our homes, in our relationships, in our church, everywhere. We are constantly being made new. That's the work of the Spirit, the anointing of the Spirit that resides in the believers. Is that true in your life? Are you allowing the Spirit of God, which you claim to have, to have its full effect on your life? Remember, we are made in the likeness and the image of God in Genesis. Though we lost it, Christ, through the work of his Spirit, in the light of his word, he is recreating it inside. And it is made manifest outside in all of our affairs. Next thing, the ministry of the indwelling Spirit, which is true for all Christians, means all three persons of the Trinity reside in you and I. We studied that in Gospel of John chapter 14 where Jesus says in verse 23, we, meaning Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, will come to him and make our home with him. Abide. We will abide in him, Jesus is saying. The triune God is in each one of us. I don't know about you, but it really gives me strength. It really encourages me. triune God is in you. And all Christians have graciously received the gift of the Holy Spirit at the time of conversion. We made it abundantly clear. And that Spirit abides in them and it will not leave them. The Holy Spirit is also as a seal on us, which, is, which gives the assurance that we are the children of God. 2 Corinthians 1 Verse 21 and 22. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. You see, I mean, you see that word is a past tense. Anointed. It's done. And when he says he abides in you, he abides in you. Nobody should doubt that whether I have spirit in me or not. He is residing in you if you have been born again. So you need to really examine if you are having any difficulty understanding these truths. The same anointing of the Spirit also teaches believe, believers about everything, that which is true and no lie, just as it had taught you, John says, abide in him. Remember in our study through the Gospel of John, we learned the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, same chapter, John 14, verse 26, John says, But the Helper, you remember the Greek word? Parakletos. He has several functions of the Holy Spirit, which is comforter, teacher, guide, who guides you into all truth, who brings to your memories, to our memories, the Word of God, not something else outside of the Word of God. So all the glory belongs to Him who abides in us and teaches us all things. He points us to all truth and no lie. John writes this verse also as he implies, gives them the truth. He also writes this word for their own comfort. Because you see, many people are departing from the truth to what is being preached by the false teachers. That's the background of this letter, right? He writes this to refute false teachers and their false teachings. And the comfort he presents them is the anointed spirit abiding in them. Anointing Spirit is abiding in you and in me. And this verse also must be understood in the context. Because there are people who show this verse and say, 
we don't need anyone to teach us because we have the Holy Spirit in us and it teaches us. That's not the context where John is writing here. John is not saying the church does not need godly teachers and preachers to instruct the flock. If that were the case, the letter that John writes is full of teaching. If that were the case, Paul's letters comes with lots of teaching and instruction. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 14, we read, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and what? Teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I will skip all of those words. You can read it for yourself. By, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. So John is not saying that we don't need teachers. But rather, John is saying that we need teachers, but we do not need those false teachers teaching us some new revelation, new understanding, new insight. If only you do these things, you will attain those as well, which are not revealed to us in the revealed word of God. There is nothing else to be added to this. There is nothing else to be added to this. The 66 books and every word he has been revealed, God breathed to us. And this is sufficient. You and I should have a high view of the word of God. If anybody says anything, you know, receive it with all eagerness, but go and examine the scriptures. It is that important. Because you're betting your life on the Jesus who saved you. It's better be the Jesus in the scriptures. I can't be any clearer than that. Paul uses many different words. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, he says, Peddlers of God's word. There are people who peddle with God's word. They take scriptures out of the context and try to build something else which is not in accordance to the scriptures. The indwelling Holy Spirit will help us understand the scriptures. The, the Spirit does not reveal any new meaning which is not already revealed in the book, but it helps us to understand. Those who have the practice of you know, digging through the scriptures taking scriptures, you know, putting side by side and evaluating it, they will never go wrong. If you take the scripture out from the context and try to do what, what they call as ICGCs, I see this in this, rather than the intent of the author, who is God himself. We must be doing exegesis of the scriptures, not what I see according to what I want to come. You know, so, so many preachers and teachers, they have introduction, they have ending, and so they pick and choose everything to come to that conclusion. That's probably not the right way to do it. If you have the truth, yes. I have many more points in my notes uh, for your discretion to uh, read. Again, uh, a couple more points quickly. This verse does not mean that every passage in the scripture is easy for everyone to understand without the help of the godly teaching. And this verse also does not mean that we do not need or take help from the commentaries. We need the help from the commentaries, which the servants of God has written and saved it for us, for our edification. Again, growing number of people, you know, they say by their own words, they serve as their own theologian inside of them, residing in them other than the anointing of the Holy Spirit. 
they choose not to hear the Spirit's understanding of the Scripture, but they are their own theologians. They come to their own conclusions. False teachers are the ones who claim to have different revelation from the Spirit, but their teaching contradicts the Word. John 14, verse 17, The Spirit of the truth, you know him, for he dwells, meaning abides with you, and will be with you, or, or will be in you. He is dwelling, and he will continue to dwell. John 16, 13, the spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. The spirit abides in you and teaches you everything. And just as you were taught, John says, abide in the spirit. Abide in him. He uses five times this word abide in these four verses. We better get that. Abiding in the truth by abiding in the gospel abiding in the fellowship with the Father through Jesus Christ in the Scriptures, abiding in Christ, abiding in the Word, and abiding in the Spirit. May the Spirit of God help us to abide, to hold on to what we have heard about the one who is from the beginning, from the beginning of our conversion. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we... Thank you for this precious time that you graciously have given to us even this Sunday. Lord, we thank you for you are the restorer of our lives, even our health. You restored our health even though we had to suffer a bit. But you have brought us all, giving us strength because you raised us to be here in your presence, to the discipline that you have taught us to commit to and to be faithful in it. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the time that where we sang your word. As we have sung, he leadeth me, he leadeth me. By his own hands he leadeth me. And may our response be, as a faithful follower, I will follow Christ. Because it is your hand which leads us. We thank you for you, the triune God residing in us. Not to leave us, but to guide us through your teaching in the light of your revealed word to us. And so, Lord... We pray in the light of today's teaching, continue to convict each of us where needed in the areas you only know. Bring it to our remembrance where we may do business with you. Give us humbleness to obey your spirit, to cause us to repentance and receive forgiveness. And so we continue our walk in the newness of life where we will be constantly being made new to reflect your image and in your likeness in all our affairs. We also pray for the challenges, Lord, that we face at hand. You know, as you taught us, and we know, the one who is in us is more greater and powerful than the one who is in the word, world who always is attacking us. Save us and spare us from all of those heartaches. We commit ourselves into your hands until we come back next Sunday. Be with us, guide us, teach us your truth, and equip us to be your obedient saints, reflecting your light in our communities and all around. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.